Live from Case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Hello and good morning. It is Wednesday, May 24th. Thank you for joining us today as a somber day in our community as it marks one year since the terrible tragedy that happened in Uvalde. We have been covering the latest in Uvalde since last year and we continue our team coverage this morning. Mark and Katrina Weber are standing by in Uvalde. We'll check in with them in just a few minutes, but first we want to get an update on our forecast. Good morning as uh, we go outside for you. We can see we've got some clouds out there as we look off to the east. We had some storms a little bit earlier, brought some rain to the area, about a quarter of an inch, in fact, to the airport. Uh, now we're just left with uh, some quiet conditions and uh, we are looking at maybe a few storms up to the uh, up to the north of us. Uh, looks like we're having a few computer issues here, but uh, yes, we did get some rain overnight and it was uh, good to see. Rain chances today are going to be on the low end, about a 20% chance of seeing some storms. We're going to get uh, these weather graphics going up here and just pass over to Stephen now with a look at your traffic. Well, Justin, we know that some of those overnight uh, storms did impact our commute. We had uh, plenty of issues out on the roadway. Let's just get a quick look right now around town. There's 281 at Grace, and you can see things are moving a little bit better out over there. But uh, unfortunately, some of the problems still remain out on the roadway. Uh, thankfully, 90 at Military and 37 at South Cross on a bad area. But earlier, there was a crash reported out there that was causing a pretty significant delay for drivers. Looks like that's clearing out, and thankfully, we have better news to report out there. But still keeping an eye on some issues, we did have a crash reported here at 35 northbound at Topper Wine Road. I'm not seeing any impacts with traffic anymore, so that may be a good news that uh, it could be clearing out as well. One last drive over here to I-10 over near Camp Bullis. We did have another crash reported not too far in the eastbound lane. So again, our morning commute has been riddled with trouble, but some of it seems to be dwindling down now. Giving you a wide view of the metropolitan area, you still see a little bit of the congestion that is building up along 410 in Leon Valley, as well as 1604 on the northwest side. That could just be normal congestion due to due to road work that's taking place. So we'll watch things closely, but it looks like we have better news to report, but still a uh, pretty big slowdowns right behind me at 410 at Jackson Keller. We'll have an update on traffic uh, coming up a little bit later, but just in sunny skies right now, so that's good news. Yes, it is. Those storms, as I said, passed by. Now we can uh, take a look at the radar here. We've got some storms to the north. I do want to watch these because they are trying to dive south, so it's possible we can see a few more isolated storms this afternoon. But for the next couple of hours, you're fine. Uh, we're not expecting much out there. Here are the rain chances next couple of days. Just some small chances coming up today, tonight, and early tomorrow morning. We may have a similar situation where we have some storms moving in uh, right around sunrise tomorrow. So your case at 12 hour forecast, 75 at 11 o'clock, 79 noontime. Look for those temperatures to be up into the upper 80s later today with a 20% chance of rain. Coming up, coming up, we'll look at some rainfall totals. We'll also check in on that typhoon out in the Pacific. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Thank you, Justin. It is the site of unimaginable horror. Students will never walk the hallways of Robb Elementary School in Uvalde again. It is now a haunting memorial to the lives lost one year ago today. Mark Austin has led our team coverage from Uvalde this morning and joins us live just steps from Robb Elementary. And Mark, has that memorial had any visitors so far? Not till just recently, we had a trickle of a few people right after sunrise. A large group just came through a short time ago as we zoom in on the crosses there in front of the Robb Elementary School sign. You see a few people milling about, few people, but a large group just came through. They brought flowers and teddy bears for each of those crosses. They also picked up flowers that blew away earlier this morning. We had some gusty winds after those storms in San Antonio. Those winds made their way to Uvalde and flowers were everywhere, but they picked all of those up and now everything is as it should be. But today, of course, is all about remembering. I want to walk you some of the through some of the events that are happening around Uvalde through today and into tonight. So at 1132 this morning, at St. Philip's Episcopal, there will be a butterfly release. Uh, Uvalde is along the migration path of monarch butterflies here in Texas. Why 1132? Well, that is the moment that the first shots were reported here at Robb Elementary School. So again, a butterfly release, 343 North Getty Street in Uvalde. Then at 1249, uh, bells will toll here in Uvalde. It'll be throughout the uh, area. Why 1249? Well, that is when 
law enforcement finally breached the room and ended the tragedy that day. 5.30 p.m., Uvalde County Fairplex, there will be a community vigil at the 215 Veterans Lane. 6 p.m., there will be a mural walk happening. There are a number of murals throughout uh, downtown Uvalde. And then at 7.30 tonight at Uvalde Memorial Park, there will be a candlelight vigil hosted by Lives Rob. That one is at 376 East Main Street. But as I said, today is about remembering the victims who died in the Uvalde massacre are being remembered today in thoughts and especially in prayers. Worshippers set to gather at Sacred Heart Catholic Church for mass that begins in about an hour. Our Katrina Weber is there with a live report. Katrina, you mentioned earlier this morning that the Archbishop from San Antonio will be there. Do we have any idea on what kind of message he will deliver? Well, I think it's a pretty safe bet that the overall message from Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierr will be one of compassion. But there's a chance, there's a very good chance that some of those words will be aimed at hope and maybe even forgiveness. That will be during this mass, which starts here at 10 o'clock this morning. Now, taking a look, you can. it looks like some of the people have already started to arrive. All these cars were not here when we first got here. But uh, the mess, again, starting at 10 o'clock this morning, uh, there could be a large crowd by the time this is all over. Who will not be inside the church are the media, or at least our cameras. There are signs posted all around this building saying that no media are, are allowed on the property, and we are definitely keeping our distance out of respect. The Archdiocese, however, has says that, said that we are welcome to attend the Mass as worshipers, but there are no special allowances for us inside the building, no area set aside, and again, no cameras allowed. And the Archdiocese is going to live stream this Mass on their sites, though. Again, Again, anyone who wants to attend uh, this mass is welcome to do so in person. It starts at 10 o'clock this morning here at Sacred Heart Church. The address is 408 Fort Clark Road, and that's again here in Uvalde. And this church has held a special place in the hearts of the families. If you recall, this is where a lot of the funerals were held in the days and weeks after that shooting massacre. Reporting live in Uvalde, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Katrina. We will be continuing to remember the victims of the Robb Elementary School shooting throughout the day. And tonight we will be airing a special program paying tribute to the city of Uvalde. The program will air at 9 p.m. today right here on Case at 12. And you can also watch it online or any way you stream. And right now it is 9.05 and we're at 69 degrees for now. We're going to take a break, but we're going to be back with more news weather. As we head to break, we want to take a moment of silence for the victims whose lives were lost one year ago today. Welcome back. It's 910. Um, you know, this morning wow. was actually nice, you know, coming out with a little breeze. It wasn't as humid as it was yesterday. Uh, the, the lightning and thought of the but thunder was was woke me up around 4 oh, a.m. Really? Yeah, oh, I, I got two wake up calls this morning. Oh. They sure did. The alarm and Mother Nature said, hey, get up. Yeah, yeah 4 a.m. We were already up. Yeah, you yeah. were. <laughs> you were already ready to, to do the show. Uh, but yeah, these storms came through. They didn't bring a lot of rain, but uh, they did travel a long way. I want to show you this uh, sort of the, the distance and the, the path that these storms traveled. So I want to take you back to yesterday and then right about uh, 8, 9 o'clock there in the Texas Panhandle, we got a good cluster of storms going. This is what we were talking about yesterday. If this could happen, then the flow would take it in our direction, and it sure did. By 2 a.m., it was moving through the hill country, and then by, say, 4 a.m., it was coming through San Antonio, and then by the 6 o'clock hour, it was pretty much 
done. Again, it was pretty quick moving, dying down as it got here. Uh, so we didn't see a ton of rain out of it, but it traveled about 350 miles, that cluster of storms, which is pretty impressive. And that's the beauty of this northwesterly flow, as we call it, where the winds are coming out of the northwest. Uh, that it can, uh, these storms can travel uh, quite a distance. Here's a look at some of the observed rainfall. We picked up about a quarter of an inch at the airport, uh, 0.8 in New Braunfels, so that was a great number. Nearly an inch there in Seguin, 0.7 in Blanco. So there were some healthy numbers, uh, especially as you got north of San Antonio, and then here are around the city. Uh, more rain on the north side than it was the south side of the county, but St. Hedwig, about a tenth of an inch, ran off about a quarter. And if you're on the southwest side of San Antonio, unfortunately, you kind of missed out on the rain. Here's a look at the live radar. And interestingly enough, we are seeing more storms developing here to our north. Another little line. It's small, but uh, the flow may take it into the hill country before it dies down some. So this is something I'll be watching. Also, this little cluster up here. Otherwise, it's quiet for now here around San Antonio. And as we look at the future cast, uh, this doesn't show a whole lot this afternoon. I think with some outflow boundaries around, we still could see a stray storm or two today. And I should mention that if we do get a storm, that it could briefly become strong. And I'm not looking for a lot of severe weather, but it could uh, become strong for, you know, a little bit before kind of falling apart. Then as we get into tomorrow morning, this computer model wants to bring in another round of storms dying down as it moves in, but moving in by tomorrow morning, maybe a little bit later than this morning's activity. This has some activity uh, moving through San Antonio around 10 a.m. We'll see the timing is always difficult with these systems. It really depends on where and when those storms develop. So stay tuned. Of course, we'll keep you updated. 68 degrees right now. Northerly winds at about nine miles per hour. Dew point is at 64. Cloud cover. Well, it's moved out, so we've got mostly sunny skies here around San Antonio, but you see some of the clouds to the north associated with those storms that we showed you earlier. So some of that cloud cover could work in a little bit later today. 72 New Braunfels, 73 Pleasanton, 73 right now in Hondo. Upper 60s, low 70s for the San Antonio area right now. And our KSAT 12-hour forecast, 75 at 11 o'clock, 79 noontime. We're in the 80s this afternoon. There is a 20% chance of a stray shower or storm and that goes right on into tonight. Again, with the timing being a little bit tricky, we're going to keep rain chances in most of tonight and into tomorrow morning. But there are low chances. 87 Saturday, 87 Sunday for your Memorial Day weekend. And for Memorial Day, we're expecting a small chance of storms. We do want to pass that along. Temperatures will generally be in the upper 80s with lows in the upper 60s. Guys. The San Antonio Food Bank is a crucial resource for thousands of families across our country, and the summer months are some of its busiest. Max Massey joins us live from the Food Bank, and Max, what does the need look like right now? Well, guys, it is thousands and thousands of families across our community, and, and take a look. I mean, we got empty shelf after empty shelf after empty shelf. Joined here with Michael from the Food Bank. So we talk about the thousands of families. What does that number actually look like? You know, we've been maxed at about 105,000 individuals a week on average. And you think about that, that's, that's a lot of pantries to fill. February to March, we saw that go up 38%. So in another 30,000 people added to that. So, you know, getting into the summer, seeing these empty shelves, um, it's a tough time because summer means two things. One, we get ready for natural disasters, right? I mean, we're going to think, how do we help, you know, our, our folks on the coast if hurricanes start to come? But really, it's about kids being out of school and those high electricity bills that hit the seniors, some super um, important things that we're trying to prepare for. Now, oh, silver lining of kids out of school, obviously they're not gonna get the lunches and whatnot, but it is more time for families to volunteer. What does the volunteer need look like right now? Man, um, summertime and volunteerism, I think about kids and the opportunity to get maybe with mom and dad, with other friends, and to, and to give back. It's so hard during the school year. There's so little time in sports and other things kind of crush in families that they don't have time to do that. And here's a big window, 10 weeks um, and the opportunity just to, to help heal our community through service. Um, when we take all ages, that's a great thing. You know, moms and dads um, can bring their kids of all ages. Don't leave them here with us, but, you know, come with them and serve together. It's a great opportunity. All right. We only got about 15 seconds left. If someone was to drop off items for the food bank, what is one item in particular that they should? Hey, cash is great, but peanut butter and jelly is going to help us a lot with kids this summer. It's an easy thing that they can make at home. It goes a long way. Michael, thank you so much. Guys, if you have any questions, we're going to have so much more on KSAT.com. And, of course, coming up on the News at Noon. Back to you guys.
All right, Mike, thank you very much. Looking like a pretty big playground for the kids, though, doesn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of space out there. Maybe some parental supervision. Probably yes. need that. 916, 69 degrees. And Robb Elementary School has become known for the deadly shooting there a year ago today. But the school had a deep history in Uvalde long before that. Myra Arthur has a case that explains episode on the history of Robb Elementary when we come back. This week, KSAT Explains brings us here to Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. This week also marks one year since 19 children and two teachers were killed here. Those 77 minutes now forever etched into our history. But Robb Elementary has a long and significant history here in Uvalde long before May 24th of 2022. That's what this week's KSAT Explains is all about. So many un unimaginable effects and ripples just keep going. My name is Mendel D. Morgan Jr. and I'm Library Director of El Progreso Memorial Library in Uvalde, Texas. I want the library to be a safe place, a refuge, a respite from what tragedies are going on in the community. So I grew up in Uvalde. My formative years were here, and in my heart, this is my hometown. There are so many stories that people have in this town connected to yes. Rob. Yes. Long, oh, yes. long before May 24th of last year. Oh, absolutely. Rob was one of our uh, very well-established uh, schools in, in the community. And I did want to share with you, my late aunt, Arlena Knows, was a teacher at Rob's school for 40 years. Really? Yes. And in fact, one of my friends, Olga Charles, was one of her students. I went to Rob Elementary. I went there and I went to room one. You have some specific memories that stand out to you about your time at Rob? Fabulous times that we all had here. We lived one block from Geraldine and then a block and a half to Rob on Park, Doty, South High, Geraldine, that square. That was my life. My brother talks about how we had gotten a TV. We we're the first ones that got a TV. And at lunch, they'd run home, grab their sandwiches and watch TV and they'd, they'd hear the bell and it was time and they'd run back and they'd get their, you know, they'd hear that before the tardy bell rang, they were in class. <laughs> that means you went to a neighborhood school. But when she was 11, the family moved to Uvalde and she was among the first students to graduate from high school here in 1891. There were three students in the graduating class in 1891. And when she was president of El Progreso Club in 1926, she was the one who went to the city to make the first request for funding for the library for the operating budget. There was a contest uh, at the time that the school was being built as to for whom it should be named. And one of my uh, late friends, a classmate of mine, uh, proposed her name because he had been actually uh, tutored by her after she had retired. I went to Rom in the, in the 50s, I, was, I think I was in the fourth grade, and I realized that there was so much discrimination here at a very young age. And back then, because of the area that Rob Elementary covered, we were all Hispanics. You know, the teachers back then were mostly white. They punished us for speaking Spanish. I was about 23, 24 years old. years and years of oppression. The school issue came up, we took advantage of that. And so the walkout did not start uh, for any other reason. The timing was right. My senior year was the, the walkout. And 
And at that point, my father says, you're not walking out, and I didn't walk out. But my best friend was out there walking, and I did not know why. I did not understand. The poor kids, they lost a year, the ones that didn't come back. The students are the ones that paid the price. We did a lot of good. We had a lot of students that did uh, voter registration. We energized a lot of the uh, younger people, a lot of people, to run for office. Now, 50 years later, I've learned why exactly now I understand why they walked out. At first, we thought it was a dark cloud over us, and that was nothing compared. We have received, I guess, thousands of cards and letters. We've received uh, quilts. We have received crosses. We have received paintings, drawings, artwork. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, everyone is trying so hard to do something meaningful. But how do you hope this library can play a role in telling the story of what happened on May 24th. We know that research will be done on this tragedy for many years to come. We will be able to professionally identify all the objects that have come to us. People are still coming from everywhere who want to come and, and be in the community to offer their support uh, and to see what happened here. Back here live in Uvalde, we can't look back without looking forward and continue to ask questions. Coming up on GMSA at 9, we're going to have a preview of a story that Dylan Collier is working about, about the investigation into the law enforcement response, or lack thereof, one year ago today, right there. We'll be right back. Hi, welcome back to GMSA at 9. We are continuing to remember the 21 lives lost in the Robb Elementary School shooting in Uvalde as today marks one year since that terrible day. But before we get to our coverage, we want to get an update on our forecast. Yeah, let's look out there with live cam this morning. A little cooler. Of course, a lot of people saw rain this morning. And if they didn't see it, they saw their cars were covered in raindrops. Uh, that's right. We did have some rain move across the city of San Antonio. And an update here, and this is a big one. We're now up to 11.54 inches of rainfall for the year. We are now above last year's total for the entire year. 11.51 is all we saw last year uh, in 2022. It was the second trash year on record. We are now past that already, and we're not even halfway through the year yet. So this is shaping up to be better for us, and it was nice to see that rain this morning. Let me show you the radar real quick because we still do have some activity uh, that is off to our north. Still some lightning strikes up here, and this is trying to move in our direction. We'll see if it holds together, but some new development towards uh, Mason. This is all drifting south and east, so uh, if, if some of this can make it in here, we could conceivably see a little bit of rain across the whole country this morning. And there's going to be some more opportunities, I think, even going into tonight with some storms that developed to our north, very similar to last night and uh, they could make their way into our area. In the meantime, mostly sunny skies this morning here in San Antonio. Then we'll add in that 20% chance of rain this afternoon. Temperatures make their way up to 88 degrees and look for rain chances to continue even into tonight to account for any storms that develop to our north and work their way into the area by tomorrow morning, guys. Thank you, Justin. Our team coverage continues in Uvalde this morning. There are still a lot of questions as to whether or not members of law enforcement on the scene that day will be facing any criminal charges. Mark Austin joins us live once again from Uvalde with more details as we continue to pursue that angle of the story. Mark. 
Yeah, David and Stephanie, one year later, it is still footage that is very difficult to watch. Rob Elementary School hallway, about 100 yards to my left, that was filled with law enforcement personnel while 19 students and two teachers lay dead or dying in two classrooms. But the question is, will any of the officers ever face criminal charges for their inaction that day? One legal expert from St. Mary's University School of Law says Texas officers can be held criminally liable for omissions or failure to act, but with an important stipulation. They aren't required to aid the public if doing so would expose them or someone else to a risk of bodily injury. And coming up later today on the News at 5, our Dylan Collier breaks it all down. And once again, there are several events happening today to remember the 21 lives lost. And we will continue our team coverage of those events throughout the day. David and Stephanie. Thank you, Mark. And one of the first people from KSET who arrived in Uvalde on May 24th last year was Lee Waldman. And she has made it a point to return to the city almost every week for the past year. Lee now joins us live. Good morning, Lee. First of all, I know you're on your way back to Uvalde for uh, the rest of the day's activities and the special tonight, but you have been there so many times. Can you describe the atmosphere in the town? Has it changed? We know today is going to be a somber mood, but has it changed over this last year or, or have you seen much of that? We've seen a lot of changes over the last year. I think um, there's been some division that's popped up between the family and also with the people in the community. Um, a lot of times the families have felt that the community hasn't stood with them when it comes to voting out certain elected leaders, whether that be on a state level or even on a local level. There's also sometimes a feeling of wanting the town itself to move forward, but when you experience a loss like this, some of the moms we've spoken with that you'll see here from them tonight, they've said that there's no moving on after you've experienced a pain like they have after you've lost a child or lost your mother in a way that they lost their loved ones uh, this day last year. So the families and the loved ones, the victims, they haven't moved on. They won't move on um, until there's accountability and justice. And Lee, we know you will be very busy today in Uvalde with the coverage throughout the day, but we also understand that you have built close relationships with the families of the victims and they have actually asked you to spend part of the day with them as they remember their loved ones. Well, how, how have you dealt with it as a reporter and personally? You know, this has been uh, a, a beautifully unique honor to be trusted to tell these stories in this way to be led to people's homes to hear about their loved ones learn about who they were um, it's been the absolute honor of a lifetime to be able to do that and with handling that as a reporter you do have to balance your job with also being a person i can tell you that i have immense love for every single person that we've had in that community it goes deeper than just telling a story or just doing an assignment you no, know, it, it's you have real genuine love for these people. So personally, it, it's a hard day. It's a sad day because last year, I remember the first drive to Baldi, I was with the same photographer, Gavin Nesbitt, that I'm with right now. And we were unsure of what we were going to experience. But throughout this last year, we've really formed some real relationships. And it's just a unique experience to love someone that you're never going to have a chance to meet. And that's how we feel about every single one of these victims. And that's how we feel about the survivors, and that's how we feel about their families, too. Of course, last year, Lee, we promised that we would remember those victims and their survivors throughout this last year. But what are we going to do going forward? Well, our reporting, our push for accountability and following this story, it doesn't stop here. Um, there are still not full answers as to what happened inside of Rob Elementary one year ago. Um, the DA's investigation into this shooting has not been completed. Many of the law enforcement agencies, they've completed their internal investigation. They handed over that material to the district attorney's office. We got an update from the department. It's finally starting to move forward after coming to an agreement with the district attorney's office for their independent investigator to have access to certain materials. So there still isn't a clear answer as to what happened that day. So that's where we step in and that's where we continue 
to hold people accountable and we continue to follow this story. There's also amazing things that these families are doing to remember their loved ones. And we're going to continue following that as well, because just because the one year mark is, is here, that doesn't mean the grieving stops. That doesn't mean the pain stops. That doesn't mean their fight stops. So we're going to keep following them every step of the way. As long as they want us there, we'll continue to be there. And Lee, you are driving to Uvalde, so your signal was cutting in and out just a little bit, but we want to ask you one more question. Our, our special program airs tonight at 9 o'clock, and what are you hoping people who watch One Year in Uvalde will take away from it? I'm hoping that when people see our special program tonight at 9 o'clock, that if they didn't know about one of these victims, if they didn't know about one of these survivors, they come away from this knowing something a little bit more about them because what we've said from the get-go is these 21 victims, these survivors from Classroom 112 and from other parts of the school, they're more than just those moments this time last year. They were full people. They had dreams and goals and aspirations for themselves. So we hope that you come away with this knowing a little bit more about them and maybe every year on their birthday you celebrate for them Maybe when you pass by a butterfly, you think of them because that was a big thing here in Uvalde, the butterflies. The families say when the butterflies appear, the angels are near. So maybe you'll think of them and maybe every May 24th, you'll light a candle, you'll say their names, you'll remember their faces. That's what I hope people get from watching tonight's program. All right, Lee, thank you very much. As you continue to drive towards you, Valley, to uh, continue our live coverage throughout the rest of the afternoon and on into the evening with the special that we look forward to very much tonight, once again at 9 o'clock, live here on KSA 12. Safe travels to you, Valley, Lee. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Lee. This afternoon, President Biden is set to remember the Robb Elementary victims. He and the First Lady visited Uvalde last year after the shooting. His speech is set to take place at 2.30 this afternoon from the White, Hill, high, excuse me, the White House Grand Staircase. You can watch his speech right here on KSET 12 or on our website at KSET.com. It is now 9.39 and 71 degrees. You are watching GMSA at 9. And we're going to continue our Uvalde coverage in just a few minutes, but we are going to step away for about three minutes and come back with Justin and the latest on our forecast. Hi, welcome back. It is 9.43. It's been a cool morning and a lot of people saw rain again today. Yeah, it was good to see some rain move in this morning. It was a little loud for, for time, but then the rain died down pretty quickly. We didn't get a ton of rain, but uh, it was enough to put us up over 2022's total for the year. Already, That's so we hit already. it. Good. Wow. We're already above that mark, so good to see that we're over 11 and a half inches for the year. So hopefully we'll keep adding to that. Uh, we talked yesterday, guys, about what was going on in Guam, the uh, major typhoon there. I did want to show you some pictures out of Guam. There is some damage being reported now as it made, or it's very, very close to making landfall. Uh, and the winds are, are strong. A lot of lightning with this typhoon, too, which is kind of odd. Uh, but you see some of the uh, pictures here coming out of uh, Guam as they prepared for this typhoon. So let's get to the satellite picture, and I'll show you uh, where it's headed now, what it looks like. Uh, so here's Guam out here, and there is that typhoon, and it is uh, right over the island right now. I mean, uh, the center of probably now moved past it. There it is. So the eye's kind of starting to redevelop. So they're on the back side of things now. Winds are still at 140 miles per hour, gusting the 165. Uh, we'll probably get a few more pictures out of Guam showing uh, perhaps damage, not a whole lot, we hope. Uh, but you can see that uh, massive typhoon as it moves off to the uh, moves off to the west and it will eventually work its way towards Taiwan and the Philippines, probably bringing some rain there. Okay, back in our uh, neck of the woods, I want to show you this picture. This is from Nancy. Uh, a lot of folks sending in pictures of the clouds this morning. They had a very cool shape to them, a uh, very interesting form. Uh, this is likely a gravity wave, it looks like, uh, from the storms that moved through in the wake of those storms. And uh, sometimes you get with turbulence in the atmosphere, you get some really cool uh, types of clouds, and that is certainly one of them. Nancy, well done with the picture taken there. And if you want to check out some more, we've got them on KSAT Connect. Uh, you can look at that on our website as well and on the apps. Uh, let's go to the live radar and uh, we'll look at where the storms are now. Nothing here around San Antonio, but we are noticing some storms developing up near Lano and Burnett. Uh, those storms are going to try to work their way south. We'll see if they hang together. I don't know that they will. 
uh, but uh, they are carrying some lightning with them. So it's, it's worth watching just because this flow is taking everything sort of in our direction. And as we get into tonight, we'll watch for storms that develop way up here around Lubbock again. That's what happened last night and make their way down here. There's still some questions as to whether or not that will happen, but we have to add in that rain chance to account for that. So let me show you the uh, future cast here. And this does not really show much this afternoon. I think with some lingering outflow boundaries, there's a chance we could see a few more storms this afternoon. Uh, so we'll keep it a 20% chance. And this model does take some of those storms that develop across North Texas and bring them down in San Antonio by early tomorrow morning. This shows around 10 a.m. Timing still in question. And at this point, this thing would be dying down, but it could bring us a little bit of rain early tomorrow before we clear out again. And I think past that, the uh, forecast becomes a little more quiet. Rain chances next few days, 20% chance Wednesday, Wednesday night, Thursday uh, to account for any of those storms that do uh, work their way down into our area. And then by the weekend, rain chances pretty much go away. Outside right now, 68 degrees at the airport, 71 at both Stinson and Kelly. Temperatures today should be up around 88 degrees here in San Antonio. Uh, 90 is probably on the map for Pearsall and Carrizo Springs for a warm and humid afternoon. And a quick check of the satellite picture shows we've got mostly clear skies here around San Antonio with some clouds to our north and some of these clouds will try to work in again with some of those storms. Still a question as to whether or not they'll make it all the way down here, but they'll certainly send some clouds in our direction. So the extended forecast, uh, 86 tomorrow, we're keeping that 20% chance of some storms early. 87 Friday, 87 Saturday and Sunday. And as we head towards uh, Memorial Day, we'll add back in some rain chances both Monday and Tuesday. Thank you, Justin. It is now 947 and 71 degrees. As we continue to mourn the 21 people killed a year ago today in Uvalde, we also remember the bright lives they had and their big dreams. Tiffany Huetas is going to tell us more about some of the victims of the Robb Elementary School shooting so their names are never forgotten. And she's going to give us a look at some of the survivors as they try to rebuild their lives. I'm back here live at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde. You may hear a helicopter overhead. I believe that is a Department of Public Safety helicopter keeping watch over the city on this, this tragic day. Uh, I wanted to let you know that uh, throughout the morning so far, we've had a number of visitors to the memorial here in front of Robb Elementary School. Uh, just a short time ago, uh, one of the victim's families did show up, and I'm happy to report that for the most part, the media is giving the families space today, and that was the idea, to let them grieve in private. want to walk you again through some of the things happening today here in Uvalde. Quite a number of tributes and events happening in just a few minutes. The Mass at Sacred Heart Catholic Church here in Uvalde will begin at 10 a.m. Archbishop Gustavo Garcia Sierra will be presiding over the Mass. It's open to anyone who wants to engage in silent reflection or perhaps light a candle. Then at 5.30 p.m., there'll be a community vigil at the Uvalde County Fairplex, which leads into the Lives Rob Candlelight Vigil. That's at 7.30 tonight. That will be at Uvalde Memorial Park Amphitheater. Now, according to Community Impact News, the event will also feature, and we didn't know about this till this morning, it will feature 21 searchlights in honor of the victims. The lights being provided by a San Antonio lighting company called North American Searchlight Advertising. Company's owner says the lights will stay on in Uvalde from sunset tonight until sunrise tomorrow morning. I'm back here live at uh, in Uvalde at Robb Elementary School. On a personal note, I want to let you know, I was here for back to school last year. And turning the corner, onto this street to see this campus is gut-wrenching. But even more emotional is the cemetery that is not far from this location where there are year-old graves that are too many to count, uh, covered in fresh flowers and teddy bears. It's a tough day. Back to you. Yes, it has been. And Mark, we thank you for your live coverage this morning. In the meantime, we are remembering those lives, those 21 lives that were taken a year ago today. We're also honoring the survivors that live with this terrible memory now as they try to pick up the pieces of their lives. Tiffany Huetas tells us more about some of the victims from the Robb Elementary School shooting and about some of the survivors. Nine-year-old Jackie Gusset has dreamed of going to Paris. Ten-year-old Tess Mata loved the Houston Astros and playing softball. Fourth grader Lexi Rubio wanted to be a lawyer and loved school. 
teacher Eva Mireles was an avid runner, and in March, the Eva Strong Memorial Run took place for her birthday. McKenna Elrod loved horses, and in April, the McKenna Elrod Seiler Roping Competition and Scholarship Presentation was held to honor her. Amory Jo Garza loved to paint, draw, and play with clay. For her birthday earlier this month, her family set up tables for painting at the town square so people could gather and remember what she loved to do. The family of Eliana Torres moved to a new house after the shooting and made sure Eliana had her own room, something she always wanted. It's now lined with pictures, drawings, and tributes. Maite Rodriguez wanted to be a marine biologist. After the shooting, she could only be identified by her beloved green converse. Apologize. Brett Cross, Uzziah Garcia's his guardian, says he's not afraid of being a nuisance and will continue to fight for change. He said he's not going to let his son be a statistic. You're going to remember his name. Those are just some of the stories of these young kids and their teacher that we've heard as their families continue to make sure that their names are remembered. But there have also been other stories that have been told about the survivors from the Robb Elementary shooting. I shouldn't have to be here. Ten-year-old Caitlin Gonzalez now travels the country calling for change, uniting with other survivors of mass shootings. Daniel Garza is now in fifth grade, but has moved to Sabinal ISD after the shooting. Maya Zamora was one of the 11 kids in room 112 who survived the shooting. She was shot seven times in her chest, back, arms, and hands. She has gone through more than 60 surgeries and still has more ahead. But she keeps her spirits up through the outlet of art. AJ Martinez and Jaden Canizales were also in room 112 and survived the attack. They have leaned on each other to help cope with the tragedy they endured. 11-year-old Noah Orona was also in the rooms where the gunman was. He was shot in the back, but the bullet missed all of his vital organs. While he's still healing, he is back to playing video games, drawing, shooting hoops in the backyard. And he now attends the local Catholic school in Uvalde. And two 11-year-old girls were honored during a ceremony last month, given the Texas Kid Hero of the Year Award. Mia Cerrillo and Chloe Torres were trapped inside their classrooms during the shooting and managed to call 911 to get help for their classmates. In a one-hour special tonight, KSAT looks at the past 12 months. Hear from families and the Uvalde community. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Tiffany. We have come to the end of this hour of our coverage. We want to thank Mark and Katrina for the live reports and photojournalists Azim Bermia and Robert Samaran. Thank you to our crews and thank you for joining us.